Welcome, everyone. So great to see you. Let's all stand and have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started with singing. Lord God, we thank you that you are our Lord, our personal Lord, our, our family Lord, and that we are all your children. And um, tonight, I just pray that you just help us to just rejoice in that. And Lord, may your word just penetrate us so that we are the children that truly reflect your light. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. My heart before you I know you see me as I am I'm met with kindness That knows no end You pull me closer Oh, there is freedom all around Here in your presence My walls come down My walls come down So I'm gonna worship with my heart wide open I don't wanna miss a thing Cause you take what was broken and make it new I'm gonna trust you With my heart, with my heart wide open Your love is constant You are disarming every fear My soul awakens with 
my heart, with my heart wide open. With my heart, with my heart wide open. With my heart, with my heart wide open. You can be seated.
change me from deep inside and recreate me all of my life I long to be more like you your heart I trade the world to follow your heart for no one else could ever Reach out and touch me with your fire That you would be my one desire, oh God All of my life I will lay down Here at the cross where I am found I'm forever
gives me peace you save me with your mighty hand Lord you delight in me through such mercy a love I just can't understand you thank you that our spirits can be quiet we can be calm in the midst of the storms of life because of you your spirit lives in us Jesus you live in us and we have you always help us to remember that Lord and just to hold on tight to it Lord thank you for your love for us Thank you for your great mercy, and thank you for just the ability to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we thank you for this time together, Lord, and just ask that you bless your word to us and teach us, Lord, and may your spirit just move through the pages of your word into our hearts and then out again, Lord, as we share it, as we live it. In Jesus' name, amen. So today's Bible study is the Child of Promise as we study chapter 21 of Genesis, moving right along in the book. So now we're dealing with the Child of Promise, Isaac, in chapters 21 through 26. And so this is going to be really fun. And as a Child of Promise, Isaac is a type, a foreshadow of Jesus Christ, the true Child of of promise. And so we're going to see many ways that Isaac is a, a type or a foreshadow of Jesus Christ, especially when we get to chapter 22 next time. And uh, so, which is a great, fun chapter. So, chapter 21, verse 1 And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. 
For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. (laughs) So the point in those two verses is God is faithful to his promises. And God promised this and now it's fulfilled just as he had said, just as he had spoken. But this took 25 years. 25 years from the promise until now. And so God's delays are not always God's denials, as they say. Our timing is not God's timing. God was getting Abraham and Sarah to the point of trusting him, of relying on him. In spite of their occasional failures and lapses, God was the one who is faithful. Why does it always seem that God waits till the last minute to bail us out? when we're in trouble. There's a reason for that. And that is to build our faith and to get us to the point where we will truly trust him. And, uh, you know, he waits to the last minute and then he bails us out and we're like shocked. Like, whoo, what a surprise that God would do something like that. Now, listen, guys, there's a difference in trusting the promise and trusting the promisor. When you trust the promise, very often you take matters into your own hands to accomplish it, like Abraham and Sarah did. But when you trust the promisor, it's all about God fulfilling the promise in his own time. We used to sing uh, that song, In His Time. In His Time. He makes all things beautiful in His time. Lord, please show me every day that you're teaching me your way that you do just what you say in your time. It was a great song, a simple song, but yet a great reminder of the fact that uh, it's in God's timing and that he is faithful to his promises. And that's an important message for us to hear. So verse 3, And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Yitzhak. Yitzhak, that's how it's pronounced. Isaac. And Isaac means, remember, laughter. Laughter. Both Abraham and Sarah laughed when they heard the promise. Abraham laughed in belief and in joy, if you remember. Sarah laughed in disbelief, which caused the Lord to say, is anything too hard for the Lord? So Isaac, as we're going to see in chapter 22, again, is a type and a foreshadow of Jesus Christ. Abraham is going to be a type and foreshadow of God the Father. And uh, so keep that in mind as we deal with Isaac. Isaac, remember, is the child of promise, as Jesus is the child of promise. Isaac's conception was miraculous, as Mary's conception was also miraculous in a different way, of course, but still a miracle. And so we're going to see a lot of similarities between the two. Verse 4. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. So Moses keeps bringing up his age because of the impossible situation. He wants us to know that this was a miracle. Abraham was old. Sarah was old. They were past the years of bearing children. And yet, here it is. They have this child. And Abraham was obedient to circumcise him him at eight days old. We went through that earlier in in the earlier chapters, verse 6. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh. And all who hear will laugh with me. Now she's like, oh, what a miracle. Oh, man, this is great, you know. And everybody's going to laugh with me. She also said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. (laughs) God has made me laugh. I love that. God is the author of laughter. And, I mean, who doesn't enjoy a good laugh every once in a while? And laughter is important. Here are some fun facts taken from research. A burst of healthy laughter can help you to reduce pain and prevent infections. Uh, 
It's been seen that there's considerable drop in the levels of stress hormones after a good laughing session. It helps in releasing endorphins, which can bring positive changes to the mindset of a person. Heavy laughter brings in much more oxygen to the lungs than normal breathing would do. Laughter reduces the risk of heart disease. 15 minutes of laughter a day can make you lose weight. It's been scientifically proven that laughter can be contagious. The maximum laughter happens over social responses, which means that only 10 to 15% of it is actually due to jokes. So we like to laugh in our social environment when we're interacting with each other. And humans are not the only creatures who laugh. Animals, like dogs and cats, also laugh. A child of the age of six years laughs about three times more than an adult. Which is interesting, isn't it? Children naturally laugh more than adults. Adults get too serious. Heavy laughter every day can strengthen your immune system. And the average person laughs about 13 times in a single day. So Sarah and Abraham were completely physically rejuvenated. Sarah was 90 years old. Abraham was 100. Sarah died when Abraham was 137. So she lives another 47 years past this point. Plenty of time to uh, raise Isaac. And after Sarah's death, Abraham remarries Keturah and has six other children by her. And so God didn't just reju rejuvenate them uh, for having Isaac, but completely. <laughs> and out of Abraham came the Ishmaelites, the Israelites, the Edomites, and the Arabic people. So something else, really. Verse 8. So the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, scoffing. So they feasted when Isaac was weaned, uh, you know, because the impossible is now the reality. And uh, the boy was maturing which they would have celebrated. And Abraham was excited about this. By this time, Ishmael was about 17 years old because they weaned children about three years old. And so he was scoffing at Isaac. He was stirring up trouble. Keep in mind, for 17 years, he's been the heir. He had been the only son, but now... Uh, because Sarah had a child, he loses the inheritance and in standing as the firstborn. And on top of that, they're having a feast for Isaac. So he, Ishmael is no longer getting all the attention. Now it's shifting to Isaac. Spiritually speaking, all of this has spiritual meaning, right? Spiritually, this is the flesh mocking the promises of God. Because remember, Ishmael is, was a product of the flesh. So it's the flesh mocking the grace of God. And the flesh, guys, is always stirring up trouble in our lives, is it not? Now, Paul picks up on this conflict over in Galatians. And this is important, so I thought we'd look at it. Galatians 4, starting in verse 22, where it says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, that's Hagar. The other by a free woman, that's Sarah. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, that's Ishmael. And he of the free woman through promise, that's Isaac. Which things are symbolic? So there's symbolism here. There's spiritual meaning to it. So he goes on. And he says, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, the law, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children under the law. 
But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. And down in verse 28, it says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. We'll get to that in a minute in Genesis here. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of of the free woman. Are you following it? So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And so he goes on in chapter 5, verse 1, and says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The lesson is simply that God's children are to live under the blessings of grace and not under the bondage of the law. The Galatians had a problem with legalism. The Judaizers wanted the Christians who became Christians to be under the law again. And they were trying to get them under that yoke of bondage again. And so Paul is saying, no, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. So Ishmael is scoffing and mocking Isaac. Now, who is eventually going to come from the line of Isaac? Jesus Christ. So who is Ishmael mocking? He's mocking Jesus. That's exactly right. Because anything, the the seed of uh, Isaac, uh, he would be mocking all of the seed of Isaac. And so the flesh always mocks and fights against the spirit. Paul talks about that. The flesh wars against the spirit. Verse 10. Therefore, she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. So that was the quote we saw a second ago in Galatians. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. It's interesting because that son of the bondwoman was her idea in the first place. (laughs) And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. And you can understand this. Abraham loved Ishmael. And, And it's been 17 years. This would not have been easy for Abraham to do. So, uh, he was, it was very displeasing to him. Verse 12. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Now, Abraham has listened to Sarah's voice before and it got them into a heap of trouble. But Sarah also listened to Abraham before, which also got them into a heap of trouble. But here, as Abraham is seeking the Lord now, his faith is grown and he's seeking the Lord, God says, listen to her voice. And that's the difference. Before they weren't seeking the Lord, they were just taking matters into their own hands. But now their faith is growing. Sarah said, God has made me laugh. And oh man, isn't it great? And their faith is growing. So now uh, they were to, uh, Abraham was to listen to her. It's important, guys, that husbands and wives listen to each other. And that we submit to each other. Submit to each other. What do you mean by that? Ephesians 5.22 says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And if husbands don't know any verse in the Bible, they know that one. But here's the deal. Do you know that in every one, every one of the oldest manuscripts, the word submit does not appear in that verse? It simply says, wives, 
to your husband as to the Lord. That's how it reads literally. The previous verse, verse 21 in Ephesians 5, says, submitting to one another mutually. That's the key verse. Submitting to one another. You say, well, man, how do we do that? How do we know when it's right to submit? And how do we know? And know? Oh, you know, it's like a panic kind of a thing. Well, you just have to read it in context. Before that verse, it says, be filled with the Spirit. Sing psalms to the Lord together. Uh, be thankful to the Lord, mutually submitting to one another. And then Paul gives two examples of that, of mutually submitting. He says, wives to your husbands as to the Lord. And then he says, husbands, give yourself up as Christ love gave himself up for the church. Give yourself up for your wife. That is submission, guys. Give yourself up for your wife. That's submission. So he's talking about mutually submitting. Wives, to your husbands, as to the Lord. Husbands, give yourself up for your wife. Mutual submission. That's the whole passage in its context, context guys. And Paul isn't done yet. He goes on to say in the first verse of chapter 6 of Ephesians, children... Obey your parents or submit to your parents. But he doesn't stop there. He says, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Mutual submission. It's the context of the whole thing. And then he goes on and he says, slaves, bond slaves, submit to your masters. But then he goes on and says, masters, do the same thing with your bond slaves. Mutual submission. It's what the whole passage of, is about. That's the main point of what Paul is saying. Not wives submit to your husbands, but mutually submit to one another. So listen to her voice. Submit to her, Abraham. Verse 13. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. So because... Ishmael is also Abraham's seed. He's going to make a great nation out of him. So God's letting him know that he's going to take care of Ishmael. But spiritually, God is saying the flesh has to go. Only the son of promise can stay. And this applies to us. The flesh and the spirit are at war. The flesh has to go. Later on, when we get to Romans 6 on Sundays, Paul is going to say it. He's going to say, Count it as dead. Count the flesh as dead. Get rid of it. Get cast it out. Verse 14. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and put it on her shoulder. He gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. And then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And so there's the wilderness of Beersheba on the south side of Canaan. And this had to be so hard for Abraham, but he obeyed and he submitted to Sarah because of the word of the Lord. And the wilderness of Beersheba was a desolate desert area. It's really on the Sinai Peninsula, the north part of the Sinai Peninsula. So he gave her bread and a skin of water. That's it. I mean, don't you find that interesting? <laughs> I mean, Abraham was wealthy. He had 300 and something servants. He was wealthy. He could have sent them away with all kinds of supplies. He could have sent them away with a caravan. So why so sparse? I believe he's exercising his faith. He has grown in his faith. And his faith has grown to the point where he's trusting God to take care of them. He knows they're going to be 
taken care of. And that's a good word for us as parents, as grandparents, you know, because we fear for our kids in the world we're living in right now. I mean, it's horrible. It's a horrible world we're living in. But we need to trust the Lord with our kids. I mean, some parents are so overprotective of their children that it becomes unhealthy for the children, and it reveals a lack of faith on the parents' part. Overprotective parents often experience intense anxiety about their children's safety. They have good intentions, but as a result, they micromanage their children and prevent them from taking risks, which causes anxiety in the children. But guys, it's so important to let them go as they grow. Let them go as they grow. That doesn't mean you throw them onto a busy street. It means let them go as they grow. Give them leeway. Let them take some risks. And then there's the hard things as well, like when our son Jesse turned 15 and he started using drugs. Oh, man. That took us, that hit us blind, it blindsided us, you know. And we were oblivious to the whole thing. That went on for five years. And we had to get to the point where we let him go. All the way to that point where we pray, God, if he's going to stay in this life of, of using drugs, take him. I mean, what parent prays to God that he would take their children? We did. Because that life, you know, was, it was awful. And we knew he'd be in a better place if God took him. So it's important that we let go of our kids. The more we held on to Jesse, the worse it got. And once we started to let go, then God started working and doing his thing. And so Abraham let go and trusted the Lord to take care of them. Verse 15. And the water in the skin was used up, and she placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot. For she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. So she was expecting Ishmael to die. Great, Lord, I'm trusting you, and now here we are, we're out of water, and he's just going to die, you know. And that, a lot of the times that's what we do when we obey God. Okay, God, you're calling me to do this, and then things don't go just right. And what do we do? You led me here, Lord, and now you're just leaving me to dry out, right? Right? And we blame God for it all when God is just bringing us through it, you know. And so the water's all gone. She's expecting Ishmael to die. Dehydration is setting in. She can't bear to watch him die, but she cries out. She's in distress. She lifted her voice and she wept. And watch this, verse 17. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God, now not the angel of the Lord, like it usually appear, appears, but the angel of God, Elohim, not Yahweh. Why? Because they're not part of the covenant. Yahweh is the covenant name. So now it's the creator name, Elohim. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. Notice how the angel of God is saying, I will make him a great nation. So again, this is an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, a theophany or a Christophany. So Ishmael cried out to the Lord as well, and God heard the voice of the lad, and God promised to make him a great nation. Why did God hear the lad and not Hagar? Don't know. 
Maybe her faith was not there. Maybe she was crying out, but she was just crying. And, but Ishmael was crying out to the Lord. I mean, he was 17. He, he knew enough to cry out to the Lord. Now notice, uh, um, all right, I already talked about that. Verse 19. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. Now, did the well just appear, or did she just not see it, or was this a supernatural thing? I don't know. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. So God was with the lad. And he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. So Paran, well, that's hard to see it, isn't it? Well, it's better up there. Okay, Paran is the Sinai Peninsula, and Arabia is right next door to the right. Uh, but Egypt is close on the east side as well. And uh, so he gets a wife for uh, Ishmael from the Egyptians, which really was a mistake. She should have sought someone from her own uh, people. And so if we zoom out, here's a big picture of the whole area. So God miraculously provides for them, and God was with them, not against them. And uh, so, um, verse 22, and it came to pass at that time that Abimelech, now remember him from last time? He's the one that Abraham and Sarah lied to about being brother and sister. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and uh, Phicol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham saying, God is with you in all that you do. So again, this is the guy that they lied to. Uh, but notice, they admit and they see that God is with you in all that you do. They recognize God was with Abraham. And this makes me wonder. I mean, can people see that God is with me? You know, I, I mean, I, I don't care about being popular. I don't care about being rich. I don't care about being famous. I just want God to be with me. And is that obvious to people? And even more, I want to be with God. But the truth of the matter is, I fail so much. I stumble I trip, I misrepresent God at times, I'm a bad witness at times, and all of that is true. But remember, Abraham lied to Abimelech. Sarah lied to Abimelech. As far as Abimelech was concerned, Abraham was a big fat liar. And Abimelech had to rebuke Abraham for lying. But he says, God is with you and I can see it. And that's the good news, guys. That is the good news. Even when we stumble and make mistakes and sin as Christians, God can still use us if we'll turn back to him and repent. If we'll just seek him with all our hearts, he will use us. Verse 23. Now, therefore, swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me. Now, why does Abimelech say that to Abraham? He doesn't trust him, right? With my off, God is with you. I can see God is with you. So, so swear to me that you won't deal with me with falsehood. With my offspring or with my posterity. But that according to the kindness that I have done to you. Remember, he gave Abraham all of these flocks and everything. He said, Abraham, anywhere you want to live in the land, have at it. With the kindness that I have done to you. What you will do to me and to the land in which you have dwelt. And Abraham said, I swear. So Abraham says, I, I will not lie to you. So remember, Abraham is living at this point in Abimelech's land by Gerar on the north side of the Sinai Peninsula. And this is Philistine area. Abimelech, again, was the, lie, uh, the, the, the guy that they lied to. 
And uh, so he's asking Abraham, don't lie to me again. And Abraham does swear and says, I won't do it. Verse 25, then Abraham rebuked Abimelech. Okay, you want the truth? You can't handle the truth. <laughs> then Abraham rebuked Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had seized. So Abraham dug this well in the land that Abimelech's men seized because it was producing water, and they wanted the water. So he rebuked him for this. And so you want honesty? Here it is, Abimelech, verse 26. And Abimelech said, I do not know who's done this thing. You did not tell me, nor had I heard of it until today. So he was in the dark about the whole thing. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. Verse 28. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. Then Abimelech asked Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs which you have set by themselves? And he said, you will take these seven ewe lambs from my hand, that they may be my witness that I have dug this well. And in all probability, it was seven wells. So seven ewes for each of the wells. When it says a well in the Bible, it doesn't mean one hole necessarily. It can mean several holes into that uh, well of water, basically. And so therefore, he called that place Beersheba because the two of them swore an oath there. So now Beersheba gets its name, Beersheba. And so Beersheba, again, on the north side of the Sinai uh, Peninsula. And Beersheba, mean, the word means well of seven or well of the oath. In fact, it became a part of a proverb when speaking of the whole land of Canaan. They would say, from Dan to Beersheba. And that was a way of saying the whole land, from the north to the south. It would be like saying, uh, for us today, from L.A. to New York. The whole land, you know. And so it became a part of that proverb. And the well of Beersheba is still there today. There are several wells that represent it there. And, but it's still there, and uh, people still visit it to this day. Verse 32. Thus, they made a covenant at Beersheba, so Abimelech rose with Philcol, Fickle, <laughs> the commander of his army, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. Then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there called on the name of Yahweh, back to the, the covenant name now, the everlasting God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines many days. Now, the tamarisk tree was an evergreen that took a really long time to grow. So it wasn't planted for the people living there then. It was planted for the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And to plant a tree in Beersheba meant that there was constant water supply and it indicates Abraham's determination to stay in that region for a time. And that his offspring would be staying there as well. And dwelling under one's tree was a sign of peaceful security. Now next time we're going to get to chapter 22. And again, this is a chapter. It's a prophecy of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ 2,000 years before it took place on the very same hill that it took place. And we're going to get in, uh, into that next time. Next uh, Wednesday will be a prayer time. Uh, and then the week after that, we'll get into uh, chapter uh, 22 and talk about that. It's a, it is an awesome chapter. Try to read it in advance a few times. If you can, let's pray. Father, thank you um, for your word today, Lord. And that you do keep your promises. Even if many years have gone by, you keep your promises. You are faithful. 
all the way through, Lord. And it's in your time, not our time. Help us, Lord, to wait on you. Help us, Lord, to be patient with you and your promises. Because we get so impatient that we try to take matters into our own hands and then we really mess it up. So Lord, thank you for this chapter and the lessons in it. And I I pray that we would take this with us when we leave this place that we would make it ours. In Jesus' name, amen. I was lost, I was in chains, the world had a hold. heart was a stone I was covered in shame when he came for me I couldn't run couldn't run from his presence I couldn't run couldn't run from his arms Jesus he loves me he loves a stone I was covered in shame when he came for me I couldn't run couldn't run from his presence I couldn't run couldn't run from his arms Jesus he loved
how can 